So our sermon last Sunday, which I gave at Eastern Parish Church, was based on 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15, which I'll read for our reflection. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved away from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. This is the word of the Lord. So at the joint service at Easter, I asked a question based on our reading from Jeremiah, which was, what are you called to invest for a return that you may never see? And I feel that in this passage and in my studies of 2 Timothy, that question expands. It expands to this. How are you called to follow the God who goes ahead of you into death? How are you called to follow the God who goes ahead of you into death? And to explore that question, the reason it's asked from 2 Timothy, we need to expand our attention and look into the whole context of 2 Timothy. So what we hear in the Timothy, in the letter, is that Paul is in Rome and he's in prison. We hear that in chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he refreshed me and was not afraid of my chains. The other aspect of it is how Paul is feeling. We can't actually divorce our attention for how he's feeling. And there's a real sense when we get to chapter 4, verse, verse 9, that he's feeling lonely and he's being deserted. So if you look from 4.9 on, it says to, he's saying to Timothy, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. So yes, he's in prison. Yes, he's lonely. Yes, he's being deserted by people. And there's this tone of wanting company and support because he's been deserted by his friends. The other aspect of this... And it's important to remember this, is it gets kind of worse because he actually knows his end is near. If you look at chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. But he's not simply requesting company from a friend in this difficult time. If you continue on in chapter 4, verse 11, on, he's saying to Timothy, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me in my ministry. And he talks about bringing books and above all the parchments. So what he's doing is actually, he's asking Timothy to join him, to come alongside him, not just to support him, but to keep his ministry going. That's worth reflecting on. Paul has preached a message and had a ministry that has put him in chains and on trial. And the reason for that is he's wandering around the Roman Empire preaching about a different king and a different kingdom. Now in Rome you were allowed to have any old god you fancied, but you didn't preach a different king. That was in effect treason, and that, as, it, as happened with Paul, 
is punishable by death. So when he's asking Timothy to join him, what's he really asking him to do? Well, the best image I've got is that Paul's head is in the lion's mouth and he's saying to Timothy, come and join me. He's saying to him, come and join me in the very acts, the very ministry, at the very prison where I'm about to go on trial, in the centre of the Roman Empire, and continue to preach Christ crucified and Lord with me, and I'm about to die. It's not an appealing request. And what fascinates me, as you reflect on it further, is that Paul is going through exactly the same process as Jesus did. He's been arrested, he's been deserted by friends, he's on trial and he's facing death and indeed he does die. And similar to Jesus, he's had his share of disciples that have deserted him like Peter. But there's a sense with Peter's, sorry, with Paul's relationship with Timothy is that he's inviting Timothy to go beyond what Peter did. So he's saying, don't, don't just stop at warming your hands on the fire in the courtyard. Come with me. Actually join me in the lion's mouth. So at the beginning of our passage, we hear these words. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering. When we hear those words, we need to realise that actually what he's saying is he's not inviting Timothy to waft around meditating on the beauty of the Lord in some spiritual manner. He's saying, this is the route Jesus took, this is the route I'm taking, and this is the route I'm inviting you into. Put your head into the lion's mouth with me. Now in the early church, certainly in the first 200 years, this pattern was actually the context you took on if you became a Christian. In the early centuries, catechism for baptism lasted about three years. It ended with a Lenten fast and you were baptised on Easter Sunday. Now the reason it took so long, the reason it was so in depth, is it was recognised that if you were baptised then at heart, what you were saying is, yes, I will die with this Jesus if need be. And these are the extreme roots of our faith. But what about now? And how does that connect with what it is to be church now? How are we called to follow the God who suffered for the will of God? Who went ahead of us into suffering regardless of the consequences? And who therefore also calls disciples to be like him, to remember Jesus Christ? I think it is rather difficult because the problem with church in modern Britain is it is extremely low risk. We are fundamentally part of the establishment, part of what it means to be British. I mean, the worst persecution we ever seem to get is to be called the God Squad, and that's hardly anything. So how do we receive this teaching from Paul and how do we become like Timothy? Well I think I need to illustrate it from probably my favourite film and that's the film The Godfather from 1973. In the film The Godfather at the beginning Don Corleone is receiving guests and their requests on the day of his daughter's wedding and what's being told is that he must say yes to any request on his daughter's wedding day. Standing in front of him is a funeral director. And the funeral director is enraged at the assault that his daughter has received and the failure of the police system in protecting her and bringing justice. And so he's come to Don Corleone. Now, he's clearly afraid and very angry and the way the conversation concludes is the Don says, yes, I will give you the justice you need. And he then says, but at a point you don't know, at a time in your life, I will come to you 
and I will request a favour in return. And the implication is, will you give it? Will you do it? To which the funeral director bows, kisses his hand and agrees to do this. It's an act of reverence. He's accepting the Godfather almost as deity. Now, when that favour is finally called in, it comes in the context of the Don's son being shot brutally and, and massively uh, after being goaded out of the family's safety. And so the picture we're given is the funeral director waiting fearfully as the Don and his henchmen turn up with the body of Sonny Corleone, which is in a dreadful mess. And the point is, I think, is that what is conveyed in the film is this funeral director is clearly terrified because what he doesn't know is what he's going to be asked. He knows he's got to say yes, he doesn't know what the question is, but he knows he may be asked to do anything. As it happens in the story, of course, he's only actually asked to do his job. And so the Don says to him, make my son so that my, his mother can look on him before the funeral. And he's to exert his skill, essentially to transform a bloodied corpse. He's doing his job. He's not doing anything else. And it feels to me that illustrates two things, ideas that are worth drawing on. The first is, like the funeral director, a readiness of heart, a willingness, an attitude of givenness. I think the core of that is the acceptance that Jesus isn't just the Lord of all creation, but your Lord. And as such, Jesus really can turn up, like the Don, in the middle of the night and demand, are you ready to fulfil the vow you gave me? In essence, are you owned by me? The second, and I think encouraging part of this, is you or I may never be called to give as Timothy or Paul or Jesus. But the work you do will be given as a given person. You will do it as for Christ. And you might be a funeral director, you might have any simple role, you might be a housewife, you might be a priest, you might be a bishop, you might be a company director, you might be the secretary to the PCC. Will you do it as one who is given? Because few of us are called to be martyrs, but all of us are called to be disciples in whatever field we find ourselves. So the question I started with, how are you called to follow the God who goes ahead of you into death? Is your heart ready? And in what you currently do, are you doing it as for Christ? Amen.